evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I could see uh, the saturation point on the face of the delegates. But still, if we are going out of time or if we are going out of interest, I found some people started clapping their hands. Just do that. We'll stop at that point of time and we'll get out of the podium. So from here we go. Infections and infestations. You know very well, as a pediatrician, still I practice as a pediatrician, as a practitioner without a dermatology degree, is very difficult to come to a conclusion. If at all you come to a conclusion, it is very difficult to choose the drug. Why? Because creams, ointments, gels, lotions, systemic drugs, parental drugs, so many things are there. So what to go, when to go, is a million dollar question. And now, just sit back, relax. We'll run uh, a pediatric dermatology clinic here. There is not going to be any text in my presentation. It is going to be only the infections, what we see very commonly in our office practice. From here, we go. And everybody knows that this is a case of impetigo. Yes. And this has got the diagnostic point of uh, crusting as well as some amount of erosions. If you see even over the, I mean, uh, filtrum as well as the tip of the nose is involved. So now we have come to a conclusion that this is a primary impetigo. Why I say primary? Because anything which happens in a normal skin, we call it as primary. Anything which happens in a diseased skin, it, call it, it is called as secondary. So this is a primary impetigo and it has got a very good crusting, it has got uh, erosion. Now, our choice is going to be topical or systemic drug. Here, I would like to go for a systemic drug as well as a combination of topical drugs. Why? Because there is a clear-cut indication where we should go for a topical drug and a systemic drug. If at all the lesions are more than 5 in number, if there is going to be a regional lymphadenopathy, if there is going to be a constitutional symptom, any one of this is present, we are justified in choosing a systemic drug. So here, even the danger area of the face is involved. So it's always better to go for a systemic drug. As we all know that this impetigo, since it is golden yellow crusted, it's most commonly it is going to be Staphylococcus aureus. And the treatment of choice is going to be penicillin group of drugs or even cephalosporins according to the body weight of the child. I'm not going to get into the details of the body weight since you are the masters of it. And please remember that in an immunocompetent child, you need to give the drug for about seven days. In a case of immunocompromised child, we need to go for about 10 days. And if the lesions are weeping, then we need to go for a cream. If the lesions are dry, we need to go for uh, ointment. And that's the second case. You see the difference, both are impetigos. What we saw was primary in the first slide and second slide, we are seeing a secondary impetigo. Why I'm telling secondary impetigo, why? Because you see that the distribution, it is mostly on the extensor aspects of the limbs and the skin is a little bit dark on uh, the front of the ankle and the skin is a little bit thickened also. So this is going to be, uh, uh, what to say, a secondary impetigo, secondary to insect bite hypersensitivity with an underlying atopic dermatitis. My dermatology colleague will even think of CBDC in this child, but still there is a close differential diagnosis for that. And here we need to go for a systemic drug. Not only we need to treat the cause that is impetigo, we need to take care of the underlying conditions also, that is insect bite hypersensitivity as well as atopic dermatitis. And now it was a clear cut case for the first two slides. And this child has got a lot of crusting and whatever we are going to apply is not going to take up. What are we going to do here? Here you need to remove the crusts. How to remove it? You just can't scrub it. So you just do or give a saline soaks. Just with a bandage gauze, just give saline soaks over it. And as if we remove idlis from the idli pans or the idli cookers, so these crusts will come off very easily and you can see a similar type of erosions what you see intraauricularly. And that is going to be the nidus for the management. Here the topicals as well as systemic. Why systemic? Because it's extensive one. Number two, the hair follicles are also involved. So there's no point in treating the hair follicles with topical drugs.
Now, I was forced to ask a question to the audience, and I was uh, uh, given this instruction by our uh, organizers. What is the best topical for the carrier state? Carrier state in the sense, recurrent infections in spite of your successful treatment. Mupirocin, right, very good. So the drug of choice is going to be mupirocin, and then now the question rises, there are other drugs like fusidic acid, sofromycin, nalidixic acid, main uh, nadifloxacin, and even the recent addition, the retapamilin. So in spite of that, we use mupirocin because retapamilin has not been licensed to use below nine months of age, and it should not be used in the mucous membranes it has, because it has caused epistaxis. So mupirocin is one drug which has got the least resistance. I mean, that is, 5 to 7 percent resistance has been reported, whereas fusidic acid has been reported with 35 percent. Now, the way to go with mupirocin is, it has to be applied over the perianal areas, periumbilical areas, and anterior nase for about 7 days in a month for about 12 to 18 months. So that keeps the carrier state away for a long time. Apart from that, the systemic drugs which can be used for carrier state eradication or elimination is clindamycin or rifamycin. So here, it is only a single lesion. It's going to be a single lesion with a vesicle, clear fluid. Should we go for a topical drug or a systemic drug? Those who have attended my lecture on, at uh, Varangal last week might be a repetition, but still, this repetition is worthwhile because this is going to be the cases what we see uh, every day in our practice. So what should we go? Systemic, why? Yes, of course, there is an adjacent swelling over the vesicle and redness is also there, so we are justified in going with systemic drugs. And see the agony in, in this child, multiple follicle involvement, that is pharyngolosis, multiple pharyngolosis, and here if you see any air follicle, you just pull it out, that's called epilation, then you can apply topical drugs. Since it is more than five in number, it's always better to go for a systemic drug. This condition is an atypical presentation of Stamp aureus. So Stamp aureus can present in this type of presentation, either the erosive form or the squamous form. So here, the topical mupirocin will help this child. Pulvovaginitis, commonly considered as candidial, but still, in an infantile age group, the pH prevailing over that particular area doesn't encourage the growth of candida. So this is a streptococcal vulvovaginitis. In the borders, you can see, in the borders, you can see uh, um, a rim of scales. So that's called collaret of scales. That is very characteristic of streptococcal vulvovaginitis. Still, if you want to do a, a sign or elicit a sign, you just touch and see, it will be tender. If you can, I mean, uh, <coughs> get the tenderness, you are dealing with a case of bacterial disease and fungus doesn't produce tenderness. Here, systemic drug will be the treatment of choice. The most severe form of infection, necrotizing fasciitis, which reads a combination of specialists to take care systemic drugs, I mean parental drugs, skin, uh, deep, I mean uh, skin grafting as well as debridement will save this child and this child was sent home from ICH. If you can make out the ring finger in this child, it has got a fluid filled lesion. So that's called blistering digital or distal dactylitis caused by streptococcus. You just make it open, then let out the contents, give the topical drugs, it should be fine. Here you can see a lot of erosions. You can see the area between the index finger and uh, uh, the middle finger that is at the metacarpophalangeal joint level, you can see a small erosion with fringe of scales. So this is called keratolysis punctata, which is caused by Corynebacterium taplin. Here, best treatment will be, the treatment of choice will be the fusidic acid or mupirocin. Again, fusidic acid will be the better choice because fusidic acid penetrates to a better level in a tough skin and especially when there is going to be a lot of secretions and when there is going to be pus, fusidic acid is going to be the treatment of choice. There is no role for antifungals here. Please look at this lesion. This child has got a block over the elbow, asymptomatic, 
on end of fever may or may not be, regional lymphadenopathy could be there. So once you look carefully, in the proximally the block is extending and distally the block is atrophic. So this is called lupus vulgaris, a cutaneous tuberculosis. And if you do a biopsy, you can demonstrate the granular mass at various levels and the ATT will be of treatment of choice. This is varicose form of cutaneous tuberculosis, cutaneous varicosa tuberculosis and sometimes the beads of pus comes out of these lesions. If you subject the pus to the microbiological examination, it will be sterile and that is going to give a clue and the biopsy is going to confirm. That's multiple lesions, scrofuloderma, that is lymph node involvement. This amount of extensive involvement in an young child Please, please look for primary or secondary immunodeficiencies. This child was treated with ATT, but we lost the child because of HIV. Any hypopigmented patch in my area, always, unless and otherwise proved, it is Hansen's disease. How to make it out clinically? Just make them to exercise and see whether that area is sweating or not. That area will not sweat in the case of Hansen's disease. If it is going to be other than that, you can elicit sweating. It is very difficult to elicit sensory changes in the face. You know very well it's bilaterally innervated. And this is coming, coming. I mean, uh, finishing the bacterial infections. We are coming to the viral infections. What we see is commonly the viral what, asymptomatic, varicose surface. How to manage by a pediatrician is that we give a keratolytic agent. Ready-made preparations are available. It's ancillic acid and keratin and lactic acid, 16.5% each, with flexible colloidon base. If you want the trade name, we'll give it in the uh, later period. Just apply it topically over the lesion, not sp uh, mean taking care not to have a spillover over the normal skin. About three weeks, the lesion falls off. If it doesn't fall off, don't mendel with it too much. Send it to a dermatologist. He'll take it off within seconds. If a wart is like this, in our child, please remember you need to rule out sexual abuse. Molluscum contagiosum. This is a giant molluscum contagiosum with daughter molluscum contagiosums. You know very well this is going to have a molluscum body. The diagnostic points are asymptomatic, glistening, pearly nodule with central umbilication. So here you just think of some differential diagnosis if you suspect immunodeficiency like pencilinosis, histoplasmosis, and cryptococcosis. If you are sure it is not due to that, then you can take a hypodermic needle, just pass it through on the surface, rotate it 360 degrees centigrade, make the umbilication bigger, squeeze it from below, the entire body comes out with a gush of blood. That's the end of the molluscum contagiosum, and that's called needling and tincture iron punch, I mean uh, patch. If you remove half of the lesions, the rest of the lesions will fall off by itself due to restoration of the host immune mechanism that's called reverse Kubner's phenomenon. If you see molluscum contagiosum like this, too many molluscum contagiosum, especially over the eyelid in, on a child, should arouse a suspicion of immunodeficiency. Fibrile child, herpes fibralis, herpes labialis, herpes simplex virus. If it is going to be recurrent, more than four episodes per year, then we need to institute acyclovir in the form of 10 to 15 milligram per kg body weight per dose, three times daily for about five days. Remember, it is herpes simplex virus, so three times for five days is enough. That is group two cycles on an inflammatory base in a dermatomal segment, that is herpes zoster. Here you need to give 15 to 20 milligram per kg body weight of acyclovir per dose, five times a day for about seven days in immunocompetent and 10 days in an immunocompromised host. Why increase dose here is the half-life of the drug is only three and a half hours. This type of rash everybody would have come across in our practice, just round or oval lesions with peripheral coordinate of scales. Most of the time it is symptomatic and this is called pityriasis rosea. It is a reaction pattern either due to a virus, most commonly picarnovirus, coxsackie virus, Epstein Barr virus, and sometimes even by a bacteria called Legionella magdidae, which responds very well to erythromycin. So there's nothing wrong in giving a therapeutic trial of erythromycin as per the kg body weight with requirement. And if this occurs in an adolescent age group, 
consider secondary syphilis also. But secondary syphilis will be asymptomatic. And this will go off by about three to four weeks. If it doesn't go, we are justified in using a moderate potent steroid. And still if it persists, refer to a dermatologist, where they'll revise the diagnosis or they'll put the child under UV chambers. That's a different form of PTV acerosia. One here you can see the lichenified, that is blackish scales, that gives a clear-cut evidence that it is going to be drug-induced. So most of the time, the common drug used by pediatrician is metronidazole, and metronidazole can produce this type of lesions. Withdraw the drug, and that will be all right. And this is going to be anybody? Anybody? Pardon? After. That's good. Hand, foot and mouth disease. What we commonly see as an epidemic nowadays. This hand, foot and mouth disease comes on the, the rash comes on the fourth day of the fever, which is going to be painful. Little uh, regional lymphadenopathy may or may not be there. And it will be round or oval with a long access to the body lines. So that is going to be diagnostic. And we all very, know that, very well know that it is going to be produced by coxsackie and enterovirus. And where does the pediatrician play a role? Here, if the fever is going to be very abrupt, high, the patient is going to be toxic, the patient is going in for systemic symptoms, then please, please look for enterovirus 71 infection, and that can even be fatal. In that case, we need to substitute an antiviral drug called plefonaril or ribavirin. These are the drugs which are available. And coming to the fungal infections, it is hypopigmentation, which is going to be dealt tomorrow by my colleague in detail, Dr. Vijay Baskar. Just a glimpse of it. This is a round to oval patch or a block with clear cut borders, with clear cut borders, pencil line borders, usually over the face, chest, back, and upper arms. And most of the time, it resolves very well with any zones, that is, any ketoco, I mean, fluconazole, topically, or um, <coughs> mechanazole, whatever it is, you can use topical zones. But please remember that you need to use it for four to six weeks. Do not stop in between. Six weeks you can use very safely. In spite of using for six weeks, you are going to give only a mycological cure, not a cosmetic cure. You just tell the parents that it will take some time for the color to take its own color. Pityriasis versicolor need not be white always. It can be hyperchromic also. Most of the time in adolescent age group, you get hyperchromic variety. And this is the fungal infection, which is going to involve the hair follicles. Here, the topical preparations will not be of much use. Still, the gold standard is the greasefulvin 10 milligram per kg body weight uh, twice daily for about four to six weeks. And even you can use terbinafin as per the kg body weight. That gives very good results because with terbinafin, the I mean, uh, resistance rate has been recorded very, very low. And please remember that the hair fall which has occurred is totally reversible after treating this condition. And this first picture, the above picture on the left, sees, says that could be a pyodermas scalp, but it's not so because you can see some scales and even the broken hairs, which is going to be in favor of the tinea capitis. And the other picture is going to have a boggy swelling with first pointings. And any general surgeon who sees this will have attempt to do an IND. This is an inflammatory form of tinea capitis, the kirion, which responds very well to the foresight drugs. This intertrigo is nothing but inflammation of the two opposing surfaces of the body, that is on zone body, we call it as. And this is going to be either bacterial or fungal. So sitting in our clinic, which to choose? Antifungal or antibacterial? If it is going to be red, sodding, weeping, most of the time it is candidial. If it is going to be fiery red, painful, tender, and if it has got cracks in it or the fissures, we are dealing with a case of streptococcal etiology of uh, this uh, uh, condition where we need to go for antibacterial drugs. Napkin dermatitis, please remember here, the convexities are involved and the flexures will be spared. Here, it is going to be a combination of eczema, staphylococcal infection, as well as the candidial colonization. And this is one of the conditions where we are justified in using combination drugs. Triple drugs can be used for a short period of time, provided that you use some barrier creams as well as get rid of the diapers. 
now we have seen so much of infections and some of the infections may or may not become all right even if we don't treat it, even if we don't do interfere. Now what happens if we don't interfere? See that. Staphylococcal impetigo has gone for. You can see the peeling effect over the left cheek. So already staphylococcal scalded skin syndrome has started, which becomes an emergency. Any pediatric infections can have uh, a foundation for urticarias. Staphylococcal colonization can predispose to atopic dermatitis. Hepatitis C virus infection can predispose to lichen planus. Streptococcal infections, if not properly treated, can lead on to gutted psoriasis, which could be a form of osteoarthritis, severe form of psoriasis later in the form, later in the life. Borrelia, borrelia management, if not done properly, can lead to morphine. Any infection, if not treated or handled properly, can lead to vasculitis. And only three slides are left. Scabies, we are very versed with scabies, and we know how to diagnose a scabies, each of papules over the classic sites, that is the Hebra circle. Just recall the Hebra circle, what we have learned in our undergraduate days. And here, the treatment of choice is going to be nowadays Ivermectin. Please remember, Ivermectin cannot be used in two conditions. That is when the child is less than five years old or if the child is weighing less than 15 kgs of weight. So if any one of these criteria is fulfilled, you can boldly use Ivermectin. 200 micrograms per kg body weight, single dose, which has to be re repeated after a week. And topically, permite, that is permethrin 5%, can be applied from the neck to toe including the retroauricular areas. And please remember that all the family members has to be treated uh, on the same occasion. And the permethrin also has to be, also has to be repeated after a week. And there should be a liberal use of antihistamines both morning and evening for a period of three weeks because the scratch or the itch produced is, uh, is due to immunological phenomenon due to the products of the mite. Periclosis. Periclosis is very, very interesting. If somebody has read my article, review article, which got published some five years back in Indian Journal of Practical Pediatrics, this lice was the deciding factor somewhere in the Greece, which even decides the mayor, mayor elections. So it's interesting to note that when you get into the history, these people, Greece people, will have a lot of big beards. So those who are contesting for the election will sit around the table with the beards put on the table and uh, um, periclos uh, lice will be let on the table and the lice goes to one of the person's beard and that person will be elected as the mayor for that year. So, so much of importance was given in the previous days. So here the treatment is going to be the same. Here what we do is we use 1% permethrin instead of 5%. Why? Because the ventral surface of the scabies mite has got a chitinous plate, which is very tough, and the drug finds it difficult to penetrate, so we use higher concentration, but here the lice doesn't have that chitinous plate. So 1% is enough, almost it is going to be the same. And this periclosis can occur in various areas. It can occur even over the palpebrarum. Here you cannot apply the permethrin, but if the child is more than five years, you can go for ivermectin, or you can use a liquid paraffin or a dimethicone over the eyelashes and just comb it, it can produce asphyxiation of the lice and it will die off. And if it is going to occur over the body, it is called corporis. And the cutaneous lava migrants, I think you can appreciate a thin line running over the distal one third of the foot. And once you see if it is going to be run in millimeters, you call it as cutaneous larva migrants, where the etiology is going to be ankylostoma species most commonly and that responds very well to albendazole, 400 milligrams once daily for three days continuously, and ivermectin if necessary, and cryotherapy, where we use liquid nitrogen at minus 196 degrees centigrade, causes apoptosis. And if the progression is going to be in centimeters per day, then think in terms of the etiological agent as strong light as stercoralis, where it is a pointer towards immunodeficiency. deficiency. Ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the closure of our clinic, and here I would like to say that what all the pictures you have seen, I also see the same, but you should train yourself to notice what you see, and that is going to be result-oriented, and whatever treatment you are going to give, 
is questionable nowadays because everybody has got internet in their pockets. Once you go off the, once they go out of the clinic, immediately they search for the drugs what you have written and the prescription pattern what you have written. Why I am telling this because I am also a consumer for a member for Pondicherry government and we see a lot of cases, a lot of medical legal cases. Even last week we decided against a surgeon of impounding 10 lakhs fine for negligence. So please remember whatever you write is a documentary evidence and please be sure of what you write. Thank you ladies and gentlemen. If you have got any queries, let me take up to the best of my knowledge. The application phase and the call, is it the same or different? Pardon? The topical Pardon? application of permethrin in infants, is it the same like adults or any difference? No, no, like as Professor Jagar Thomas said, you need to dilute it. So, uh, Sashner Pediatric Dermatology clearly says that you should give one third dilution. And in the case of neonates, this, even this permethrin is not permitted above, I mean, uh, below one month of age. So below, below one month, below yes. one month, you need to use only sulfur precipitate. For adults, we use 10% sulfur precipitate, and for neonates, I mean, in I think the first thing the baby would do it, put it in the mouth. How do you handle that? Simple. You apply it and apply a meter over it, so it becomes occlusive, and the concentration is going to increase, and the result is going to be much better when applying it topically, just leaving like that. Or you can advise the mother to apply it when the child has started sleeping. That's one way you can tackle. Like and subscribe Eagle Media Works.